Okay, my feelings on first impressions are complicated. Typically, I consume media in one of two ways. There's the bingey, chewing through the episodes to get to the meat of the story kind of watch. Then there is the three to four hour rewatch while taking notes to review. Whatever. Can I go? Each type of consumption tends to net drastically different results, and I've mentioned a number of times how watching an episode for the purposes of making a video about it has allowed me to appreciate levels of depth and connections I'd missed before, and elevated my experience of it. But the experience I had with First Impressions, an episode I found irksome during rewatches, was... Unexpected. Joss Whedon has said that he created Buffy as a feminist parable, the journey of an adolescent girl transitioning into adulthood, and the trials she would face on her path. Given Mutant Enemy's regular emphasis on theme and the protagonist of Angel being a dude, it was inevitable that the topic and questions about masculinity would come up in some form. Frankly, I find the idea exciting. A corresponding discussion of masculinity strikes me as a necessary and important balance. Nature abhors a vacuum. And because of that, it isn't enough for reformist social movements to just tear down the old ways of doing things. New models need to be put in their place. People can't just be told what not to be. A discussion of what is strong, healthy masculinity in a changed society is an important thing. All of that said, I think First Impressions ends up wandering into that discussion and a few other topics accidentally, and in doing so, mires what is otherwise a pretty entertaining and fun episode. Greater scheme, the big picture of crunch. Yeah, Nothing to do with your slave with them. I just can't see the hammer. There's a lot worse things out there. The system doesn't work in spite of you. Nothing works with us. Why is it that I'm not on the floor this time? Lauren seems to indicate that Angel has been visiting Caritas frequently. I know that Buffyverse storytelling traditionally shies away from the use of therapy as a storytelling tool. Well, love becomes your master and you're just its dog. And he's dead. But as I've said, I actually kind of enjoy therapy and storytelling, and I love the manner in which Lorne works as Angel's counselor. In this case, it's a dream sequence, and Angel's revealed desire to actually be praised for his singing is adorable. You've been practicing, haven't you? A little. Yeah, and so shows. You think? Lorne tells Angel he's reached a bend in his journey, but doesn't offer much clarity as to what that means. He then opens into a beautiful rendition of Get Here by Brenda Russell, and the camera moves across the club, revealing the bend uh, girl in question. Through this very cool one where the bar goes from packed to no one on the floor except Darla and Angel, the dream is revealed. The romance of Darla's red dress, Angel's schoolboy smile, and Andy Hallett's sweet dulcet tones is actually lovely. Though, imagining all the extras having to run off stage camera right to pull this off is kind of hilarious. Cordy and Wes are dusting, literally this time, the new digs of Angel Investigations when Gunn shows up with a problem. Devac. Demon, set up camp in my neighborhood. He put two of my men in the hospital last night. So could one of you go in there and knock on his coffin? Angel has apparently been dealing with a bout of whatever the opposite of insomnia is, so Wes and Cordy offer to help. On cue, in comes David Nabbit. The ensemble all get introduced, and David reveals his superpower when Angel asks for financial advice for the Hyperion. Oh, that's easy. You could look into seller financing, take over the owner's payments, and skip a bank completely. Or you could apply for an FHA and get a PMI in lieu of a down payment. Is anybody else getting warm? Yeah, a, a little actually. This whole sequence is great. This post-credits opening scene feels like a stabilizing here are our characters for this season type of moment after the ups and downs of the previous two episodes. And this moment of Nabbit's competence was his first in any of his episodes where I felt a glimmer of why the writers had been bringing him back from time to time, other than to just be a foil for Cordy. He never really felt like he fit the current template of the show until this moment. His superpower is way more interesting than the silly nerd bit. Too little, too late, I suppose, as this ended up being his last appearance. Gunn's informant on Vladi Divok gets squirrely and tries to back out. Gunn understands and takes it all in stride. A fight ensues, all a little hyper-edited, but if you watch closely, I love the use of the practical dust when Cordy gets staky. Gunn gets impatient with the team's need for some recovery and goes off on his own. Cordy and Dennis have become the best of roommates, as ever I love any and all Dennis stuff. Cordy has a vision involving Gunn, can't raise a 
slumbering Angel, who is dreaming of Darla again, and so sets off to find him herself. Dream Darla indicates she has to go and makes a curious statement. I'm in danger. Wesley wakes Angel, who reacts you made her go away. unexpectedly. This is another example of a shot in 16x9 but intended for 4x3 issue I brought up in Judgment. Angel, the character, is naked in this sequence, but David can be seen wearing boxers that were supposed to be cropped out. Would it have been too much to ask for a little Boreana's butt? It's not like we haven't seen it. Cordy gets the Angel mobile stolen, and Gunn thinks he has a contact who will know who did it. The contact in question points them in a direction, but has already been taken under Vladi Divac's wing. Gunn Delia heads to a party that gets attacked by Vladi's vamps. Cordy goes Cordy on the car thief and finds out where the Angel Mobile is. At Vladi's chop shop, the pair are attacked. Wes and Hot Pink Angel show up to back them up. Then, in what feels like an unintentionally comical sequence, did you really need that extra flip, Angel? LA's changed you, man. Vladi takes an axe to the head. And in a moment that feels a little the more you know, Cordy tells Gunn her visions were warning her that he was actually the threat to himself. I ain't buying none of this Dion Warwick crap. Really? I mean, because you live in a world with vampires and monsters and stuff. Didn't you dust your sister? And you're here with a woman that gets actual visions of the future, and this? This is what you don't buy? But it's all a defense mechanism, and Cordy manages to tear down the uber-masculine front for just a moment. Angel retreats back into his dream world haven with Darla. But who takes care of you? You do. <laughs> and the episode ends with some implied dream oral and the reveal that Darla is actually there in the room with him. Honestly, the previous episode, Are You Now or Have You Ever Been, is probably as hush or the body as Angel gets. A captivating highbrow stylistic departure from the norm that generally causes me to wonder, wait, what was the episode after that one? First Impressions is an outing I tend to forget about but still find pretty entertaining. It's a lot more like the first episode of the season, Judgment, and has many of the same hallmarks. The show's total composition position of acting, design, and overall storytelling just continues to feel more and more confident. And this episode has a ton of neat little elements. I love the surprise of Angel headbutting a woman to reveal she was a vampire, and the team suffering aches and pains after the episode's first vampire fight is one of the moments that makes Angel feel unique to Buffy. Similarly to its use of viscera I brought up last season, seeing the team spent and deflated gives Angel a little more grounded and gritty feel, whereas on Buffy, injuries, typically Sam, are played more often for yucks. The episode is telling essentially two separate stories, one about Darla and Angel, which is the one with the whiff of the season arc to it, and the other about Gunn's Divock problems. There is some overlap, of course, through the incorporation of foreshadowing, but they're mostly distinct from each other, and you sense that when watching. So, with the aid of Wolfram and Hart, Darla is invading Angel's dreams every night to snuggle him to death? Not a great plan. Well, all right. Hang on a moment. Dream Darla continues her character's reinvention from Darley Quinn of Buffy Season 1 into something far more interesting. Her machinations in this episode are subtle and conniving in a perfectly wonderful way. Clearly, Darla is present and aware in the dreams. You haven't told anyone else about these dates of ours, have you? But isn't doing anything particularly nefarious. So what's going on? Well, one line of Angels in particular made something click for me. Why are you so good to me? After everything I did. And I thought, man, Darla's being so comforting. Wait a second. I want to take comfort in you. And I know it'll cost me my soul. And a part of me doesn't care. Uh, sneaky, sneaky. Darla has structured her seduction here very much around the aspects of Angel's more selfish and impulsive feelings for Buffy that the first tried to manipulate in amends. Take her. She wants you to taste her. Think of the peace the desire for comfort satisfaction and peace. And Darla already tried to connect herself with Buffy when she and Angel first saw each other again in Sunnydale. And last time I saw you it wasn't high school girls. Don't you like? In Angel's dreams here she even happens to run ice across his chest. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, mortal coordination <laughs> something to be desired? Wrong. It's just right. <laughs> <laughs> Why are you so good to me? It tracks that Angel would still be vulnerable to this kind of attack. In the first season, Angel's continued longing for Buffy's companionship showed up quite a few times. She was a hottie. Come on, let her. She's something. Is it all squeeze ears? Yeah. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. I'll never forget. 
And I mean, sure, they had some squabbles in Sanctuary, but Angel went to Sunnydale, punched Riley in the everything, apologized, and left on good terms. Angel's path to this episode is a chosen one, but he and Buffy didn't part ways because they fell out of love. And Darla playing on those desires that move Angel towards the dark through the medium of dreaming where we are emotionally defenseless and vulnerable makes the attack even more unnerving. She's also building resentment towards the rest of the team. And did any of your friends say thank you? Not exactly. Angel's reaction to Darla, even in dream form, shows actual joy at seeing her. He smiles like a kid with his crush. Her stroking his selfish desires is working. The lyrics to the Brenda Russell love ballad in Angel's Dream have an almost furious self-interested focus when not being sung by Andy Hallett's beautiful voice. I can't wait another day. I need you. Right now. Right here. Right now. I need. I need. I want you to get here. And indeed, Angel obliges by sleeping more and more. The other story in this one revolves around Gundelia. The title, First Impressions, is probably a reference to Pride and Prejudice, originally named First Impressions before publication. Like Cordy and Gunn's journey here, Austin's novel is about two very different people spending time together and revisiting their first impressions. And this is the second Angel title to reference Jane Austen after the previous Sense and Sensitivity. On the surface of it, their odyssey through Gunn's Neverland may look entirely like a Gunn-centric tale. Gunn does several things that appear he is letting the battle itself overwhelm his ethical compass, from beating a snitch for just not wanting to talk, what you doing? What I gotta do? I got people dying. and after Team Angel pleads for a regroup and maybe a healing salve, Gunn gets impatient with them and immediately chooses to go off on his own. The weight of the dark world he has to face keeps pushing him to extreme measures he thinks he has to take in order to win. And I was reminded of Angel succumbing to his dark impulses in Are You Now or Have You Ever Been? Take them all. In fact, Demon Devox specifically makes a comparison between he and Gunn. How does it feel to finally meet up with someone even nastier than you? And Devox wearing a similar shade of red, albeit one that has been dirtied and worn over time, is a nice visual reinforcement of their connection. And his assuming human form further blurs the line between man and demon. But Cordelia actually has a wonderful little arc of her own in this one as well. I've pointed out several signposts on her journey since the show started, but it's important to always recognize that Cordy is always Cordy. I'm a bitch. I'm not a sniveling, whiny little cry, Buffy. Her story in the battle has been much more about figuring out where that person belongs as she comes to understand the stakes and the scope of others' suffering. We have to help them. And in this episode, we get a quick taste of how Cordy is always Cordy. Grace stained all over my new outfit. But when the vision of Gunn comes and she can't find Angel, Cordy never hesitates and immediately sets out on her own, refuses to let Gunn pressure her, and is calm and collected in the face of violence. To the point where, by the end of an episode in which she started out by complaining about grime on an outfit, she is covered in the blood of a woman she tried to save that she just met for the first time, and it barely seems to register. And in that scene where she finds Gunn raging over what has happened, he lets slip the driving source of his actions in this episode. I can never take it easy, not for a second, all right? The minute I forget that, somebody like Alana pays the price. Alana. Veronica. We all got something to atone for. Whether he's being driven by the need to atone for what happened to his sister, or the fear that the same fate may befall someone else, Gunn has let the battle and what the world has done to him justify one particular mode of action as inevitable. What are you doing? That's what I gotta do. I got people dying. Remember, there was no one in Cordy's vision of Gunn except Gunn, and Cordy finally gets through to him. Devac wasn't the danger my vision was warning me about. It's you, Charles. It's how you live your life. You don't just face danger, you create it. At the end of their journey, Cordy and Gunn have a new appreciation for each other, though Wesley and Gunn still remain a little adversarial. Shotgun. And that's probably all the episode was going for with this story. Gunn being fiercely independent, isolating himself, abdicating his moral compass, Cordy telling him he needs support, and Gunn finally accepting it. But the problem is that Gunn's language in several places throughout this episode qualifies his independence as specifically 
masculine. Always enhances a guy's rep when some skinny white beauty queen comes to his rescue. And in previous episodes, he's also related his independence to race and class. I don't need advice from some middle class white dude that's dead. Once he starts doing that, the episode begins to slip into a bit of theme soup. One where ingredients work against each other instead of together. And the way Gunn's dialogue is written, he's continuously tying the theme back to broader issues of race, class, and masculinity. You know, I gotta tell you, you are one high maintenance chick. It's not just Gunn, though. The structure of the episode as written starts muddling things up even more. David Nabbit was used in Warzone to contrast with Gunn so they could be the embodiment of the haves and and the have-nots, respectively. David makes their connection explicit again in this episode. Identify yourself, traveler. Are you also a fellow demon killer? And Gunn later uses David as an argument for why his decisions and way of life have to be the way they have to be. You mean like your friend David Nabbit? You think you became a billionaire by being a good citizen? And the series' introduction to Gunn so far makes things in this episode even more muddled. Gunn's world has been continuously painted as separate, distinct, and somewhat unknowable by his white co-stars, as they constantly stumble into awkward situations around him. He's a great guy with a really fly street tag. What's he fly? Cordy's working girl racial awkwardness in this episode is a repeat of that same joke. It's intended to be self-deprecating as Gunn and Veronica stand around and let the various white people dig their own graves, but it still has to work off the idea of other and separate, not trying to see Gunn for who he is, but defining him by his circumstances. His very first episode made obvious symbolic parallels to his life being like Peter Pan's in his world to Neverland. And so, for all intents and purposes, Gunn is from a magical dimension, impenetrable and alien to the rest of the cast. What's bizarre is that the previous episode, Are You Now or have you ever been, handled Judy the exact opposite method the show has dealt with Gunn. Rather than emphasizing how everyone is separate, the episode tackled issues of race and homophobia by connecting them to our main protagonist. Judy was half white, half black, but passing as white and feeling isolated and inauthentic for pretending to be someone she isn't. She and Angel bond, and the episode uses their own mutual sense of isolation to emphasize their similarity and connection. It's just blood. Judy. It's all just blood. He's a great guy with a really fly street tag. What's he fly? By instead drawing a line between two worlds, the writers have been emphasizing separation, inadvertently codifying one side as normal and the other as strange and unknowable, and putting Gunn in the awkward position of figuring out how to move between them. And the world building here doesn't do the soup any favors as it plays on old, tired stereotypes. Yeah, well, business is business. You should think about minding your own while simultaneously downplaying and deflecting them. Can't you, you know, hotwire it? Just because I know some car thieves don't mean I am one. So, carrying the bog of these accidental connections to their fullest extent, Gunn is a proud, independent black man who is taught the error of that fierce independence by a young white woman? Yeah. And putting aside Gunn for a bit, once the theme has been tied to masculinity, it inadvertently casts several other scenes in weird, confusing lights. In an episode where Cordy is trying to show Gunn the errors of his masculine independence, Wesley and Angel essentially engage in a stake measuring contest. After Wesley refuses help from a muscly, wang out Angel who is standing over him in a dominating fashion, Wesley, in their following scene, feminizes Angel by forcing the hot pink helmet on him. Thank and you know, when you really think about it, how come I have to wear the ladies' helmet? Stop being such a wanker and put it on. Hop on board, gorgeous. And I'm not sure exactly what to make of Darla in the soupy masculine feminine context as she dotes on Angel throughout in hyper-romanticized sequences, culminating with her giving him a blowjob. Again, I don't really believe all the extra racial and feminine masculine commentary was intended. Mostly, it feels to me like the writers were just using Gunn's verbal fixation on gender, race, and class as a stock character affectation. When you limit the blast radius of what he says to just that, Darla's actually just look purely schemey again, and Angel fussing over Hat Head and the Pink Helmet, not his first display of fuss, is just funny. It's actually one of my favorite occasionally displayed traits of his. You got peanut butter on the bed, and the reason there's a wet towel on my leather chair. Problem is, throughout the episode guides, I've chosen to focus on the execution of any episode rather than speculating on intent. Sure, Faith saying Little Miss Muffet was probably not intended to be a reference to Dawn at the time. David Fury most likely saw that episode and decided to add curds 
brazen way into real me after the fact. But we're talking about the shows as collective finished creations, regardless of what order the brush strokes went on the canvas. If we weren't, holy hell would we be selling Gunn's character short here. In various interviews, the Mutant Enemy writers have said they never worked for a series that puts as much emphasis on theme as Joss demanded. And that's one thing I love about these shows. That's ambitious, and ambition is always more interesting. Problem is, sometimes you just don't stick the landing. Contemporary discussions about ethnicity, stereotypes, and tropes in storytelling often feel like a bit of a mire. Are we never supposed to have stories that deal with questions of race, sexual violence, homosexuality, or gender? Of course we are. Weighing the value of their use, though, is to me mostly a question of execution and payoff. Does the use of them find something new and innovative to say? Does it turn the prism of our perspective and reveal something interesting? Does it do the traditionally marginalized, as with Judy, justice? In the case of first impressions... How about that? Thank you not so much. The two different worlds stuff eventually works collectively over the series as part of Gunn's arc, and pays off in an interesting fashion. The problem is that in these early one-off episodes, it just feels so tired and on the nose. Generally, as they move Gunn away from those stock archetypes, which the writers don't seem to know how to develop, his character just becomes more interesting. That any of this material works now is a testament to J. August Richards' stunning charisma. And that, other than the mishmash of ingredients in this theme suit, this is a pretty entertaining episode. In fact, when I went back and watched First Impressions a second time for this video without my laptop in front of me, I probably enjoyed the episode more than I ever had previously, because the elements of the story I found ambiguously irksome were now clarified and understood. And that is really one of the rewards of having this discussion in the first place, to clarify and understand what might have been storytelling missteps and why they were. So we can say, all right, cool, I get it, and then just enjoy the rest. <laughs>